Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. work that's been motivated by a new collaboration we've got with the Department of Anthropology. So um, my background is mobile robotics, machine learning, and this is kind of similar to robotics, but not, not so similar. Right. So um, one of the things we do in machine learning a lot, uh, especially in reinforcement learning, is to simulate balancing poles. That's a classical control problem. And so usually we do that with small simulations. Um, we've got into through talking to, to anthropologists, we've got in, interested in real skeletal systems. So this is a real skeletal model of a human, and we've learned a controller to allow that human to balance a pole. Uh, you can see here there's perturbations to the pole. Uh, but what we're doing here is controlling real muscles, real simulations of muscles using anatomically correct models. And so what I'm going to talk about today is why I think this is important, uh, why I think it's cool, and why I think it's significant and to give you some idea of some of the computational mechanisms behind it. Um, so like I said, this is motivated by talking to anthropologists. We're going to, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about what an anthropologist is and what they're interested in. Um, cover some of the, the, the machinery behind this, some of the reinforcement learning techniques um, at a relatively high level. Um, and then sort of drift into our new stuff, which we're calling computational biomechanics. And then, since this is very new, talk about what we're up to this week and then what we're hoping to do in the future. So, anthropologists. Um, the basic thing about anthropologists is they look at creatures, they look at things in the world, creatures in the world, and they try and work out why they're like they are and why they're doing what they're doing. Um, the things to notice is that when you look at a chimpanzee, you're looking at a, a chimpanzee right now, not a thousand years ago, not a million years ago. And you're looking at a chimpanzee, not something that's halfway between a chimp and an orangutan. And so their sampling of creatures is very discreet and very limited. Um, and that makes it really difficult to answer some questions that they're interested in, questions of evolution. How did chimps evolve to be the shape they are? How did they evolve to walk the way that they do? And one of the, the things that we're interested in is helping them answer these questions. And this is sort of the main motivation of this work. Um, Questions that they're interested in, questions that anthropologists are interested in, are really fairly basic. Why do chimps look the you know, why, why does a chimp gait the way it walks? Why does it look the way it does? Um, there's some notion that it's probably optimizing something, but we don't know what it's optimizing. Is it sort of optimally stable, optimally efficient in terms of energy transfer, uh, minimum jerk, fast? What? There are a lot of hypotheses, but there's no consensus in anthropology about this right now. Um, if we know what the chimp is optimizing for, we can say something about what the evolutionary pressures on that chimp were. So if it's optimizing for speed, then there's probably something it had to run away from. Okay, so we can answer deeper questions. Um, why do chimp bodies look like, they, look like they do? Why are chimp's arms longer than ours? What problem is that solving? And you can phrase that as a, an optimization question too. And how does that morphology change as you change that optimization pressure? And how does, the, how does the skeleton, how does the, the, the shape of a chimp affect its behavior? Is it the case that we are optimizing for the same thing as chimps when we walk, and the differences in our gaits is just because we have different bodies? Chimps have different hips than we do. Um, I guess that's it. So the, 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 as computer scientists, as computational scientists, the answers to these questions are really quite obvious. What you would do is you would model the system, and you would do some optimization, and then you'd look at the result. The problem is that the systems that these people, that these anthropologists care about are really high dimensional, they're really nonlinear, they're complete skeletal simulations um, of creatures, and often creatures and environment. That makes them very difficult to do optimizations over. Very high dimensional, very nonlinear. And the models that they use are not well suited for optimization. So if, if you've ever done any optimization, it really helps to have functions that are uh, continuous and smooth and well behaved. The muscle, if you look at um, the way that muscles are modeled by uh, anthropologists and biologists, it's, 
it's sort of this mishmash of equation terms, just things that match ob observation with no real um, effort to make them good for computational techniques. So part of what we've been doing is looking at these, these muscle models and trying to adapt them so that they work better with optimization techniques, but still are realistic. Um, in anthropology, there's been some work in looking at optimization, but because of the, the, the large, the high dimensionality of the system, it's focused most, mostly on open loop control. So the idea is that you learn a controller to maybe make your chimpanzee model walk, but that controller doesn't take into account the state of the system, where the legs are, or the environment. It's a function of time. It just sequences the joints in the set pattern. And you can do optimization over that, but the claim is that that's not a very good optimization because that's not what chimps do. They really do take account of their, their, the angles of their joints and the environment. And so with an open loop controller, if you were to simulate that walking across a flat floor, it would, it would probably be fine. But if it were to stumble, it couldn't recover from that stumble because it has no notion of its own internal state, of the state of the, the chimp. Um, I'll go out on a limb and say that the, the techniques that they're using for optimization are sort of the techniques of last resort. So they're using genetic algorithms and techniques that aren't informed by gradients or no, techniques that aren't that efficient. So there's some work, but it's not that great. Our contribution to this is going to be closed loop control. We're going to learn controllers that actually look at the state of the system, the, 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 the body position of the chimp or body position of the model, and drive it based on that. We are going to use that to do optimization over. And I'm going to claim that that's going to provide a better optimization, a more realistic optimization. Um, most of the questions that these guys ask can be phrased in terms of reinforcement learning, uh, which is uh, one of the things that we work on. And so what we've done is we've taken some of the machinery from reinforcement learning, applied to these problems, and we're just starting to get a little bit of traction. Um, I'll talk about reinforcement learning in a bit. But the, the main challenges, the main technical challenges to this are it's a high dimensional system, uh, continuous state action and time, which proves to be difficult for tradition, traditional reinforcement learning. Um, there are constraints on your musculoskeletal system. There's constraints on your arm, for example. You can't, you can't gracefully push your arm past 180 degrees. Okay? And building in those hard constraints is tricky because they lead to discontinuities in the functions you're optimizing over. So coming up with graceful ways to do that. And coming up with graceful ways to do accurate simulations of contact forces. Um, despite a lot of work on that, we still don't have a really good way of modeling how my fist hits this table and really stops, rather than sinking into the table and then coming out a little bit. So I'll talk about that a little more as we go through the, the talk. This is all work in progress. This is literally happening. My grad student is literally working on this as we speak. Um, and so some of the results are, are relatively preliminary, but uh, they show some, they look encouraging, I think. All right, so reinforcement learning um, is a machine learning technique. Uh, I don't want to get into the mathematics of it, but the basic idea is you have an agent. Um, in our case, that is going to be a model of a chimpanzee or a human or a, uh, an extinct hominin. An environment. For our purposes, that's going to be the joint angles and angular velocities of all the joints in the system, uh, the contracted, contracting states of the muscles, and maybe a description of the actual external environment of the, of the, of the simulation. The agent gets to observe the state. Um, in this case, we're going to assume you can observe the state exactly, because we have the simulator. It does some thinking. It performs an action. That's either going to be applying a direct torque to each of the joints, or it's going to be applying an activation to the muscles. We'll talk about those two different regimes in a bit. That's going to change the environment. It gets to observe and act and observe and act. Every action it takes generates a cost from the environment. That's going to be how expensive was it for the agent to do that thing. And that's going to be a mixture of a cost for muscle activation. It actually costs you energy to do something, plus a reward which motivates the robot towards its robot, the, uh, the system towards its goal. So if we're trying to optimize a gate for running, then we'll have a penalty for each muscle that we pull, and we'll have a reward for how fast the, the, the system moves across the simulation. 
Uh, we're going to use a, a dynamical systems notation, uh, which is a little different from reinforcement learning notation. Basically, your state is your new state is going to be your old state plus some function of your old state and the action you took over time. The action you took is going to be controlled by a policy pi, which is just a function that maps states and the current time to actions. Um, this is sort of a more general formulation. In the work that I'm going to talk about, um, this is going to be stationary, so you can sort of ignore time. Um, this should actually be a, a C rather than R. Uh, the cost is just going to be a function of the state you were in and the action you took. Okay, and we're given those. Unlike um, some uh, approaches to reinforcement learning, we have the plant model and we have the reward model, the cost model. And so the ultimate goal is to learn a policy pi that maps from the states you're in and the actions you take, uh, from the states you're in to actions that you want to take. And that mapping is going to minimize the sum of costs that you incur over your lifetime. So it's a pretty standard reinforcement learning thing. The, the main intuition behind the, the techniques that we're going to use are that although these systems are really high dimensional, we don't, we don't live in that high dimensional space. So your body has a lot of joints. Um, your, your joints can be a lot of angles, a lot of angular velocities. But there are some of those, some parts of that space that you'll never visit. Okay, so I can't lift my hands higher than this behind my back. Okay, so if you can identify the, the states that you can be in, that's going to be a lower dimensional subspace. Formally, it's going to be a manifold in that high dimensional space. If you can find that, then you can do much more efficient computation. You can work on that subspace, on that manifold. Um, the, the way to think about that is if you, if you watch me walking across here, my body is going through, if I don't wag my arms, my body is going through the same set of states over and over again, more or less. So I start here. That's one particular point in state space. And then you can imagine that point moving as my joint angles move. Then I get back to here, and I'm roughly where I started again. So there's a big loop in state space. If you can find that loop, then you reduce my body dynamics to a 1D structure. And you can do learning over that 1D structure. Um, really good for cyclic gates. I'm going to talk mostly when I explain this about cyclic gates, so you can think of this big ring in a high dimensional state space that we're tracking over. Um, it also works if that's just a ribbon in state space. It also works if that's uh, basically any well-defined manifold, so a small plane or a sphere or something. But I'll mostly talk about gates because it's, it's more intuitive. We're going to estimate that. And we're going to do our le learning over that, and it's going to let us sidestep what's called the curse of dimensionality. So the basic idea is we're gonna, you're going to give me a system, a model of a chimpanzee, and an initial policy, an initial guess at um, a walking gait. I'm going to run that, and from the states that I see the system going through, I'm going to estimate this manifold, this 1D structure. I'm then going to learn a locally linear controller over this manifold. So at each state I sample, I'm going to learn a linear control scheme that drives me to the next state along the manifold. I'm going to then run that, that new controller, which is going to result in a slightly different gate than the one you gave me. That's going to allow me to re-estimate that manifold, that ring in state space, because I'm going to be on a slightly different one now. Once I do that, I'm going to learn a better controller for that ring. Then I'm going to run that better controller, which will give me a new ring, and I'm going to rinse and repeat until it converges. And what that's going to do is it's going to give me a locally optimal controller, a locally optimal gate, according to the criteria you've given me. Any questions? Yeah, yeah oh, please do. Please. Okay. Um, don't you have to have like, a decent uh, gate to begin with? Ah, yes. So um, it depends what you're doing. So I'm going to show you um, some simulations of swimming robots. For swimming robots, you don't have to have a decent gait. You can start with random twitching, and it'll do the right thing. For a walking system, yes, you have to have something that has a stable cycle. Um, the, the intuition is if you have a system which can fall down, whatever fall down means for that system, then you have to have something that doesn't fall down to start from. Um, Normally, that's a, pr a problem if you think about robots, because you've got to design this initial gate. But um, for this application in anthropology, we're sort of interested in questions like, if we start with this creature and then try to evolve into this creature, can we do it? And so there's usually an example initial gate. So we would take a chimpanzee, say, or, and motion capture it, figure out the gate from that, and then that would give us our, our initial guess. But yeah, that's. 
it, so the, the limitations of this are you need some need an initial gate, and it's only a local optimization. Um, so a manifold, when I say manifold, I actually mean manifold in the strict mathematical sense. Um, if you don't really know what that is, it's kind of any surface with no folds, tears, intersections, or anything strange happening. So you can think of a sheet of paper as being a manifold. And the idea is that locally on this manifold, you can treat everything as being linear and Euclidean, and it kind of works. Okay, I don't want to really get into it more deeply than that. Um, if you don't want to think in mathematics, whenever I say 1D manifold, I mean ring in state space, the ring that my system state evolves over. All right, so here's an example. Um, imagine I've got a system and it's walking, and I sample a few states. I start here. This is one set of joint angles. This is another one. This is another one, and so on. What I'm going to do is I'm going to learn a controller at that state. And so if I find myself at that state again, I'm going to drive the system using that controller. It's going to be a linear control. And that's going to drive me towards this state. So it's, it's just standard control theory. If I find myself between these two states, I'm going to take the control from this guy and this guy and blend them together depending on how far away I am from them. And that's going to drive me to this guy. If I'm slightly off here, so I, I walk around, I don't end up in exactly the same position, but I end up in a similar position. The control is going to be blended from the nearby guys, and it's going to drive me back towards that manifold. Okay, and we can prove that. I won't bore you with the detail. Okay, so the, the intuition is that if you take the whole space, the whole gate cycle, so I start here, and this is one stride, and I'm back to where I started, there's, that implicitly defines a manifold, okay, this ring in state space. We're not, going to ex we're not going to explicitly model this. We're just going to keep these states around, and that, that's good enough, the states and their connectivity. There's an intuition that there's a space around this in which, if the robot finds itself, these controllers will drive it back towards the manifold. They'll stabilize the gate. Okay, so you can drift off. You can stumble a little bit. A stumble would be would end you up slightly off this, but the controllers will drag you back towards it. Okay. For smooth systems like swimmers that I'll show you, this is a really big region. For systems uh, which have catastrophic failures like walkers which can trip, there's going to be points on this where this isn't that far away. A trip will send you outside of this, and all guarantees are off. But we're not going to make any claims about that. So when you, oh. when you relearn the manifold, are we simply relearning these states? Yes. So we... So we're going to run this, we're going to do the estimation, we're going to learn a controller, and then we're going to use that controller to, do an, to get another set of states. This ring is going to change, and these boundaries are going to change on every iteration. And we throw away the old ones, and we just use the new one. Um, so how does it help us? So we're not going to explicit. Um, if we knew the topology, in, in the case of a, a walker, we know the topology, it's a ring. We could actually explicitly model that. The benefits of doing that is we can actually do things, we can do calculus over that surface then. We're not going to do that. We're just going to implicitly represent it with data points because we don't want to get, we don't need to get that deeply into it. Um, this is also good because not all systems have a topology that we know a priori. Um, we're going to use an implicit representation. I think I've said all that stuff. Um, we're going to stitch things together. We're going to learn local controllers and have local information. We're going to stitch that together using pretty standard techniques for mathematics. Um, linear controller at each point, it's going to drive us along the manifold to the next point. We're going to blend those together. I think I said that. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to learn, a v to, to improve these controllers, we're going to learn a thing called a value function at each of these points. The value function is going to be a mapping of the state I'm in and the action I take to the long-term value to me. So think of that as the integral of cost I'm in a state, I take an action, I incur a cost. The state I end up in, I'll take an action that will incur a cost, and so on. The value of a state is the sum of the costs from that point onwards if I take that first initial action. Okay? That's recursive. So it's cost plus the value of the next state. The value of the next state is cost plus the value of that state's next state. Um, and that recursion is going to be important to us. Um, and the goal is we're going to learn this value function around the bit of the space we've seen, and we're going to use linear controllers to drive us to the low-cost states. And that'll, that'll improve us. Um, so our techniques are based on a, uh, 
an intuition called differential dynamic programming, which started, which first started making the rounds in the early 70s. It's been reinvented and rediscovered every decade since the 1970s, and this decade it's our turn. Um, the, we've, we have some modifications that make it better for this. I can talk about that later, but uh, I don't really want to get into it. Uh, basically, it handles nonlinearities a little better than the original system. Um, so this, we're going to run the system forward. Once we have that loop, we're going to run this algorithm backwards and estimate, using dynamic programming, the value at all of the states on there. We're then going to run the f forwards again, re-estimating the controllers. Okay, and we'll get, I'll cover that in a bit more detail. Any questions to that point? Fairly clear. All right. So these are some states, time k minus 1, k, and k plus 1. This is a forward pass. So we're running a controller that you've given us, or running the controller from the last time step. Once we get to the end, and for a, a cyclic gate, we're just going to cut it somewhere and say that's the end. We're then going to take a backward pass where we're going to estimate at each of these states that we've seen a quadratic ap approximation to the value function. Okay, and that's going to be, if I'm in this state, what's the, what's the, the value of the states around this? Okay? So low cost states, low value states, let's say low cost states are where we want to aim for. Those are the states that are going to minimize our total sum of costs over our lifetime. So we're going to learn these quadratic approximations going backwards, and then we're going to change the controllers to drive us towards the minima of these quadratic approximations. Quadratic approximations because we know where the minima is and we don't have to hunt for it. This is the whole state space of the system. So although we're only operating on a 1D thing, we do have to do some work in the full state of the system. So we don't completely avoid the problem of high dimensional systems. But we, we sort of avoid them mostly, he said, fudging. Um, all right, so what we're going to do, we're going to go forward, we're going to cut the ring at some point, and we're going to say that's the end. We're going to assume that we can calculate the value function at the end. So we're going to have a, a, a finite horizon. The value function is going to be 0 at the end, or it's going to be some set number. So we can, we can just establish that. Step, taking a step back, we can calculate the value function here by taking the point we were at, generating a bunch of points around it in the state space, and running them forward through the plant model f. Right, that tells us if we were in these states, and we did the action that the controller here said, we would end up at these points. Okay. We've, got a, we've got the cost model, so we know how much each of these actions is going to cost us. We know it, where we're going to end up. So we can use the approximation here to give us the value of the next state. And we can add these two things together and get the value of the, all of these states. Right? This is just straightforward dynamic programming. Once we do that, we fit a quadratic to it, and then we go back to this one. Bump, 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 bump. So that lets us get a quadratic approximation at each of these guys. Once we do that, we just change the, the linear controllers to drive us towards the minima of those local quadratics. And that will result in a lower cost trajectory through the space. All right? Um, if we find ourselves, when we're actually running this controller, if we find ourselves between two points, we're just going to blend between them um, using... Uh, Gaussian kernels, pretty much standard stuff. Um, the closer you are to a point, the more you're influenced by it, and it, it tails off as, a, as, a, as an exponential. All right. This, for some reason, doesn't play in PowerPoint, so I'm just going to do this. Um, which one? So here is a system, actually where we have 10 state dimensions. This is going to be a simulated walker. So you're going to see two legs and a body. Um, it's not realistic. It's not as realistic as the skeleton we showed you initially. This is just a test case. It's going to be 10 state dimensions. Those are going to be the angles of each of the limbs, each of the five limbs, and their angular velocities. There are five action dimensions. The torque you apply to the knees, the two knees, the two hips, and a body pose. Our reward is forward speed. Right. We're not penalizing actions here. We're not, there's no action cost. So what the system will do is it will learn to walk forward. Okay. Um, this is actually a slightly more complex system. I'm not going to get into why it's more complex, but 
it handles rough terrain. So it's actually pretty difficult to get a control theory solution to this that's robust over this sort of variety of terrain. Um, I can talk about that in more detail afterwards. Uh, we started off with a system that basically learned on flat ground, and then we incrementally varied the, the terrain. Flat ground, because it was easy to get an initial walker to do that, it's quite easy to get a control theory solution for that. Then we vary it to make it harder. The control theory walker falls over, but we're able to um, track the terrain. Um, the, the interesting thing about this video is the terrain, oh, whoops, wrong one. The terrain isn't part of the state. The system knows the terrain it's on based on its body pose. Okay, so we're not explicitly sensing the terrain here. Uh, these are visualizations of the 10D space. You can, the thing to take away from this is there's cycles in here as, as it walks. And so we get robust walking over varying terrain without sensing the terrain. No, the, the system was trained over a train like this, and a train like this, and like this, and like this, and like this. It wasn't trained over this. You can make this anything you like, and as long as the gradient of the terrain is something that it's seen before somewhere, it'll be able to handle it. So, um, so the way to think about it is that it's, it's on some terrain, and it takes a step, and that step lands its body in another pose, and that pose sort of implicitly codes for the terrain that it's on. And as long as it's seen that pose or has been close to that pose before, the linear control there will, will do the right thing. It, this is actually a bit more involved. It's actually a 2D manifold. So it's a, the way to think of it is that there's a ring for flat terrain, and then there's a ring for slightly inclined terrain, and a ring for more inclined terrain. We construct those into a cylinder. And what the system's doing is it's going around the cylinder. Gate cycle is around, and terrain steepness is up and down. So it's actually going over the surface of the cylinder. And where it finds itself on that cylinder determines the next step and sort of implicitly codes for the terrain it's on. What about in changing gradients? So, for example, what if we had a step structure? Um, so it would have to skip the next one, right? Yeah, so the, uh, that, would, that would break this one uh, because this is only going to be good up to the range of terrains that we've seen, and we never trained it with a step. Um, and that, a step is... A step is harder because as long as you lift your leg high enough to get over the terrain, then this will work. If that step was larger than it lifted its leg, because it doesn't know the steps there, because it's not sensing it, it'll trip. So we're very careful that none of these terrains rise faster than you can raise your legs. So this is kind of And is there any particular contrived. challenge with transitioning between two gradients? No. No. So um, I can talk about that later, but the idea is that the system's going round and round a ring in state space, but there are actually many rings that it's going around, that it could go around. One for flat terrain, one for slightly more steep terrain. And the way we've got it constructed, it's, it's smooth and continuous around that cylinder. I, that needs a few more pictures and a, a more explanation. I can, I can talk about that later. All right. So that, that kind of worked. Um, The other one we've got is a swimmer. This is a. Does the thing say a little bit more about the training phase? How much, how much time, how many durations do you need for? Um, yeah, that. Uh, so each individual terrain converged in tens of iterations, um, minutes of computation time. So it's actually quite, quite efficient. The, the trick, the, the, the trick is the observation that. A good starting point will converge quicker. And, and so if you're going to learn this terrain, and you already know how to do that, that's a pretty good starting point. So the first, the first learning from the initial controller takes a little bit longer. But then each incremental thing doesn't take that long at all. Um, it's, it's implemented in MATLAB, so it takes 10 times longer than it could if you implemented it in a real language. Um, So here are a couple of swimmers. This is a simulated viscous fluid. This was our initial policy. This is a five-link swimmer. Um, ten state dimensions, angles and velocities. Four action dimensions, dirt torques on the joints. Um, simple viscous fluid simulation, no vortices, nothing complex like that. Um, and this just shows that we do actually learn a better controller. Um, 
This was generated with central pattern generators, applying a sine wave to each joint. And it does OK. This has learned a little more, um, a little better of a policy. The thing to notice about this is that you can't fall down when you're a swimmer. And so you could start this from just random flailing. And with high probability, it would end up with a decent system. Although it would take a lot longer because you don't have that good start. The, the way to think about that is that the, the optimization surface in this space is really big and really convex. And no matter where you start, you're going to end up in the right place. Wouldn't it happen that you can follow the same place or move in weird directions if you start randomly? And then you just wouldn't get any reward? So the thing is that if you're, if you're a five-link swimmer, anything you, in, in a fluid, anything you do will move your center of mass just because of the physics of it. And your center of mass, this is a 2D simulation, some component of that movement is going to be in the x direction. And that's going to give you a little gradient in cost. We're rewarding speed in this direction. So anything you do that gives you a little bit of a kick this way is going to be rewarded. And you're going to do that again. And so it's possible that if you flailed around and you didn't move in the x direction, this would never converge. This wouldn't do anything. But because, just because of the nature of the system, um, anything you do is going to move you in the right direction. It'll take longer to converge if you start randomly flailing, but it will do it. Edit. So swimmers. Um, slightly more involved, swimming to a target. So that one was kind of blind. We were rewarding just going that way. This one, uh, the code of this is available if you, if you like. We've now increased to 12 state dimensions. Now we've got the, the, position, the relative position of the target from the head of the swimmer, which is the red bit, and it's learned to swim to the target. The cool thing that comes out of this is it's learned we're penalizing actions. We're penalizing the cost of wagging your arms. And so it learns to coast. If you watch when this moves away from it, maybe. So let me restart it, because I know there's coasting it's at the beginning. So we move the target. The, we're, we're penalizing the distance, the square distance between the head of the swimmer and the target. So it allows the coast, right? It gets itself in the right way. It gives a big kick, and then this is really energy efficient. So the Michael Phelps of simulations. The thing to notice too is we're not. That's not a hard target, so it doesn't hit the target and stop. What happens is when it gets to the target, it pulls in its legs to absorb its momentum. Because if it overshoots, then it gets it incurs more cost. Um, and you can, you can confuse it, and you can make it do the wrong thing. But you see, as, as this gets close, it pulls in, and that absorbs all the momentum of the system. So it's a, kind of a, an unexpected nice demo effect. Right. So we can use those techniques which learn controllers. We can also use them to learn morphology, the shape of the system. So if you take the parameters of the system, the length of those limbs, say, and have them as part of the state space, you can use similar techniques to optimize the length of those limbs. And what you can do is interleave learning this morphology with learning control. So you learn the optimal controller for the current body, and then you freeze that controller, and then you optimize the body shape for that controller a little bit. Then you freeze that, learn the optimal controller for the new body, back and forth, back and forth. Um, we don't have any formal convergence guarantees on that, but it seems to do the right thing in the situations that we've tried it for. Um, I don't have a video for this, but we, we played around with muscle attachment points. So if you allow the, the muscle attachment for your bicep to change and you optimize for lifting power of your, forearm, of your hand, the muscle attachment will drift out towards your wrist. Okay? And you can put in constraints that don't let it go too far. and um, That's kind of nice because that lets us experiment with changing body types and changing uh, muscle morphologies. The cheesy demo, which isn't the great demo, is um, here. So we start off with a system with short legs, and we allow the morphology of the legs to change, and we reward speed. And what it's found is that if your legs are longer, then you walk faster. And so it's, it's learned to extend those legs. The gait is different. It's a slower, more pendulous gait. So it's, it's simultaneously learned a different gait, but with longer legs. And so that's kind of the, the, the cheesy caricature of it. 
And again, this is 10 dimensions, 4 action dimensions. So, uh, still. so well, that brings us to computational biomechanics. Um, those problems had the character, character that we made them up and then we solved them, which is a, a great tradition in computer science. Um, I then started talking to an anthropologist, and that sort of motivated using these techniques for real biomechanics problems. And so the rest of the talk is sort of videos of what has come out of that. Um, Basically, it's those techniques applied to a more realistic system. The more realistic system we're using is uh, a simulator called OpenSim out of Stanford. And it's for simulating biomechanical systems. So real skeletal models, real muscles. The red doesn't show up very well here, but all of these red things are muscles. Uh, they have really good models for human. Uh, that is a Tyrannosaurus leg with hypothesized muscle attachments. This is your neck with all the muscles and tendons. It does accurate muscle and tendon simulation, so tendons will stretch and stuff like that. Um, this fearsome creature is a house cat. Looks like a, some sort of saber-toothed tiger, but it's actually a house cat. So the simulation does not just human simulations. Uh, there are XML descriptions of the skeletons and the attachment points and the muscle models and all that stuff. Um, funded by the NIH for real clinical work. So part of the motivation for developing this is saying, if you do surgery on the hand and you move the tendon, how will that affect the performance of the hand? So this is actually mostly geared towards clinical work initially. But it's now at a stage where we can use it in optimization work, work like this. Um, and so here's a guy. This is 21 state dimensions, which I claim is kind of good for reinforcement learning. Um, we are learning to balance a pole. So the manifold that we're learning over is going to be a disk. Okay, there's going to be a, think of it as a set point and an area around that set point. The way we implement that is we have a controller in the middle where we think the set point should be, and then um, linear sequences of controllers out that cover the disk. Um, three action dimensions. We're actually going to control the torque at the elbow and in two dimensions at the shoulder. Okay, and so we're, what we're learning is a mapping from 21 state dimensions to three action dimensions to balance this pole. You're going to see a dot here. That's where all the mass of the pole resides. This is just a simulation. We don't have a, a pole with extent. And you're going to see green arrows pushing the pole to show that it's stable. Or you're, yes, you are. All right, sweet. OK, and you see, after a bit of learning, um, it's actually pretty good. This took about an hour to learn, because it's a much more complex system. And pushing it through OpenSim is actually fairly um, slow, because there's a full physics simulation in the system. Um, the thing to notice with that is we've, we've learned to balance a pole um, based on a really s a single, simple linear controller, which is only stable very close to the top, very close to the upright position. So this is starting to get a little towards what anthropologists are interested in. Not that they're interested in balancing poles, but there's an optimization function. There's a real um, simulation of a real, real animal system. Here, we're only simulating this bit of it. We're only using this bit of it. The nice thing is that we can move to a more realistic model. Now we're not going to control the joint torques. We're going to control the activations on the muscles. Okay, that's harder because there are more of them, and they're in antagonistic pairs. Plus, there's a lag. You set the activation on the muscle, and then there's some time lag before it actually contracts or expands. And so the thing to notice about this is it looks much the same. Uh, we've got five action dimensions now instead of three. But our learning techniques are sort of agnostic to that. They don't really care what you're controlling. OK, so this is sequencing the muscle. And it's a little different. The character's a little different. I have a video of them side by side. Um, so this is them under the same perturbations. And you can see for small perturbations, it, it's kind of the same. But when you really start agitating the pole, the direct torque responds better. So you'll see, especially at the end, the arm has to go like this, because it's not able to respond fast enough because of the lag. Let me show that again. Do the muscles also take into account um, the 
we have finite muscle precision? Yes. Yeah, so this is a really realistic model. You set an activation, and it gives you a, a rough contraction. You know, it, it gives an anatomically correct contraction. The muscle models for these are horrible nonlinear things. And so a lot of what we've been doing to get this to work is to take those muscle models and make them behave better with optimization techniques, but still have them perform like real muscles. This is, the, this is the newest work. Um, we're interested in opti optimizing things that people do. So um, baseball pitchers look very contorted when they pitch. There's this sort of like huge bundling up, and then they, they do a weird action. Is that the optimal baseball pitch? So we can phrase that in terms of biomechanics. What we want to do is optimize for the speed that the ball leaves your hand. Okay? So that's a, a good optimization criteria. We can do it with our musculoskeletal system. I want to. I want to look at that. Uh, I'm British. I want to see if the cricket pitch, cricket delivery, is the optimal cricket delivery. The rule is you're not allowed to bend your elbow. So is that really the optimal? I mean, there's not much you can do, but is that really the optimal? Um, throwing a javelin is really weird because your arm's straight. Is that really? You, you sort of lead with your shoulder, and it's it's this very awkward looking thing. Is that the optimal javelin throw? Okay. Um, high jump. That bizarre flop thing, is that really the optimal high jump? And so this is starting to get at that. Um, we're trying to learn to throw here. We're going to use direct uh, joint act, uh, muscle activations. So seven action dimensions. There's seven muscles in here which aren't shown. 21 state dimensions for the arm configuration of the arm. We're going to penalize the actions quite heavily. So large muscle movements are going to be penalized. This is going to be a very energy efficient throw. There's a red dot here. We're going to optimize for the speed of that final, speed of that dot at the end of the throw. Okay? Um, this isn't optimized all the way out to convergence, so the throw is going to look a little weird, but it's sort of indicative of what we can do. Okay, and so what we started off with the, the initial policy was a swing, just a very, a very gentle swing. And what it's learned is that if you're penalized for um, muscle motions, it's more efficient to move the small muscles that control your hand than it is to move the large muscles that control your shoulder. Okay? Um, I'm told by my anthropologist that this is actually how chimpanzees throw. Okay? And so if you move this into a lower activation cost, it's, it's cheaper to move your muscles, then the system finds different optimization. Okay? Much more shoulder movement because you can generate faster... This actually has a, a, a lower cost. This has a, a better reward because you get a bigger motion. But it's the balance between the cost of activation and the speed. Um, so this is neither baseball nor cricket. It's probably like petanque or something like that. Um, so that's, that's kind of where things stood. As because you don't measure the entire body, right? right, right. And that's just isolated from here down. Right. Yeah. And so once we get into that larger body thing, um, I think it's going to be a lot more interesting. Um, these simulations took 15 min about 15 minutes to push through to this stage. Um, but they're not, up, they're, they're not converged, so I, I don't have a good feeling for how long they'll take to run to convergence. All right, so current work, what are we up to now? That, that was as of Friday morning, so this is <laughs> what we did over the weekend. Um, a lot of our work is taking OpenSim, which is not really designed for the purposes we're using it for, and modifying it such that it works well with us. Um, getting the muscle models to work right, getting the constraints. You're not allowed to bend your elbow back too far. Um, if you just introduce that as a hard constraint, it gives you a discontinuity in some functions we care about, and we can't optimize over that. Um, if you treat it as a spring system, which is common, the closer you get to it, the harder a spring pushes back you can go through it, and that has some weird effects, uh, sort of bounce back effects. And object contact, we don't have model, we, we, we don't have the ability to have external objects, like a real ball in there right now. We kind of fake that with, uh, with the current system. So we're working on that at the low level. Our initial experiments that we're planning to do for the rest of the year are, like I say, throwing, things which you can do without external contact forces. So throwing, um, I've got a history of martial arts training. I'd really like to know what the optimal punch is, because I spent a lot of my life learning how to punch things. 
and there's all these sort of very subtle things. I don't know if any of you guys have done any martial arts, but the, a punch actually starts in your hips, and there's this, this weird body thing that goes, and you hit the target, and you flick your hips back. And it's this weird whole body thing. Is that really optimal? And we can answer that question now, I think. Um, the caricature of how we can profit from this is then I go to martial artists in the cage fighting tournaments and tell them how to punch better. Um, I shouldn't say that at Microsoft because I'm sure you'll leap on that product idea. Um, future work, we've got some funding proposals into NSF to look at real anthropology questions. Now that we've sort of established we can do this kind of thing. So we're proposing to build, we have a model of a human already in OpenSIM, we're proposing to build a model of a chimpanzee, which is kind of cool because we get to take a chimp and put it in an MRI and actually build real physical models of it. Um, and also to build models of uh, Australopithecus lucy or uh, Keratom boy. There's, an, there's another one, um, WT15000 is its official designation. These are human precursors. They look kind of like us. They look kind of like chimpanzees. How did they walk? So if we can build a model of that from the skeletal record, there's pretty good ways to hypothesize muscle attachment points and muscle configuration. Can we find out a gait? Um, that's a question that anthropologists really care about. What do chimps optimize for when they're walking and they're climbing? We optimize for ground speed, probably, maybe, or metabolic efficiency. Chimps are not very good at walking, and they're pretty good at climbing. But what's the balance? What's the actual optimization function? Um, can, we, can we extend these techniques using ideas like Minimax, where we, we learn not just to optimize, but to optimize in the face of risk and uncertainty? That's our big thing for the next year. Um, the cool thing about this is if we can take a, an initial system, like a chimp or Lucy here, Start, use that as a starting point and then evolve the morphology in the controllers and get to humans without any um, significant hurdles. And that really means without any large gradients in our optimization. Then that's really strong evidence for evolution. And that's really strong evidence that we were descended from whatever we started from. Um, and that also gives interesting points that we can look at points in between. And this is something that anthropologists want to do. They have you know, maybe a chimp and a human, but they've got nothing in between a chimp and a human. This lets us hypothesize in between and see how, how things developed, or if things developed. Um, concluding thoughts. All right. If you're a reinforcement learning guy, if you're a machine learning guy, or a robot control guy, these are great systems to test your algorithms on. They're high dimensional. We have the entire model. And so that makes it a little bit easier than working with humanoid robots. If you're a robot guy, Whenever I say biomechanical system, think humanoid robot. Okay? It's the same caricature, the same character of, of space. Um, in this space, there's a lot of tasks from the very simple, the pole balancing thing is really quite simple, up to complex things like whole body climbing, like a, a chimpanzee climbing a tree. What's it optimizing? That's a, com a, that's a very complex simulation. And so there's a whole range of things where you can start off with your algorithms on tractable problems and move forward. And the, the kicker for me is that anthropologists really care about this stuff. And it's, it, in computer science, we, 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 we come up with problems and we solve them, and that's great. We write papers and we, we go to NIPS, and it's fantastic. But this actually will let us do real science. So this is computational science as opposed to computer science, in that we're giving tools to anthropologists to let them answer questions that actually have a bearing on something bigger than reinforcement learning or computer science. And that's all I have. Um, I don't know if you've got questions or... Yeah. So first of all, the reinforcement learning. Last time I looked at reinforcement learning, they were dealing with the castle, one-dimensional. Yeah. And it seems that you, you're working with much more complex Yeah. Systems. Now, you didn't... You talked very lightly about reinforcement learning, about the algorithm. Yeah. Do you have any contributions in that domain? Is there a reason why you're doing so much better than... Yeah, well, the trick, the, the trick is with the, the systems that we usually deal with, like the cart pole, um, they learn a value function for that, and then they solve for the value function, but they learn a value function over the whole space. Right? So cart pole is a four-dimensional system, the angle and velocity of the pole and the, the position and the velocity of the cart. And so that's a four-dimensional space, and you can learn a value function, approximate a value function over that whole space, and get a globally optimal controller. 
Our contribution is the tricks for not having to learn over that whole space. So, yeah, so finding the manifold and learning over the manifold. Because if we had to learn in 21 dimensions, we can't do it. And so the trick is finding that manifold and doing the control over the manifold. You give up some stuff. You give up, opt you give up global optimality guarantees because you're not looking at the whole space. You give up stability guarantees, although you can start clawing some of those back from control theory. Um, but what you win is you can actually solve the problem. If you were to use traditional techniques for this, it just, you, know, you just couldn't do it. And so there's, a, there's actually a, a growing interest in RL right now with these manifold techniques of how you sort of focus attention on the right part of the space. Um, I sort of hid some of the stuff. You know, I was talking about um, a manifold. Sometimes there's more than one manifold, and we learn over both of those, and we blend between them. So you can think of a horse walking, galloping, trotting. Those are very different gates. So you can think of those three gates, li three rings living in different parts of the space and being able to hop between them. Yeah, yeah. And you know, there's a point at where the two rings are close and you can change from a, 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 a canter to a gallop. Um, so there's a lot of, lot of interest um, in, that, in the, the topology aspects of RL now, sort of identifying the systems where this will work for. This won't work for every system. So if you imagine uh, a random MDP, this won't work because a random MDP is going to live in the whole space. But for systems that are constrained, hmm? right. And I think there's a, there seems to be a growing interest in RL now who are not solving the most general problem. So it used to be that you had to be able to work on a random M MDP, otherwise your technique wasn't any good. Now there's more of a, a recognition that you, know, you, you, you can make some compromises in order to solve more realistic problems. Right. And since you're putting the plug in the rewards in. Well, no, I mean, you, can, you can scale the rewards and it should give you the same thing. Um, when you have sort of complex computing things built into the reward, um, so muscle activation and metabolic cost, if you were to add those linearly, then yeah. I, I agree about the cost. I'm talking about the rewards. Right. So the part where you try to drive different rewards from score. Right, right, right. Yeah, I mean, it is somewhat sensitive to the, the reward scheme, the cost scheme that you choose. Um, some of the stuff that the anthropologists are interested in really does ground out in very concrete things like um, metabolic cost. You, they'll stick oxygen sensors on chimpanzees and have them climb and estimate how many calories they're burning as they climb. And you can model that pretty closely. And so you could model, then you could express muscle cost and the overall cost in the same terms. You know, um, and then it becomes a clearer question. But yeah, you're, I mean, you're right. The, the way that you set up the, the optimization is going to affect what you get out at the end. And also, you know, it's possible in some systems that many systems they have multiple rewards. I mean, right, sort of right, right. Uh, for example, efficiency versus speed, right. or maybe midpoint. Right. Right? Yeah, so absolutely. Right, and that, this kind of falls down in that you, you've got to have a scalar reward. Um, how you come up with that scalar reward, if it's a linear combination of things you care about, that's really going to affect you. Um, one of the things you could do with this, though, we've, we've talked about, we don't really have a good plan for it, is you could learn the... You, you could learn what you're optimizing to get the best... So suppose you wanted to, to run really fast. You're going to be optimizing for strain on your joints and metabolic cost and a bunch of stuff. But you could have sort of a meta reward function and learn the, the parts of that. Actually use machine learning to estimate the reward function that produces the best overall global behavior, which is forward speed. Would those be the equivalent of sub-goals in reinforcement learning? Not, not, not really. It's, it, it's sort of difficult to articulate. We haven't really thought about it that that hard yet. We don't have a good answer for it. But there seems, 
let me restrict myself to saying I think you can do some meta-learning over those parameters that might be useful. But we don't know how to do it yet. In terms of the, the transition between two behaviors, so a horse um, galloping mm -hmm. and whatever else it is that the horse does. So the trotting. Cantering and trotting, yeah. yeah. Right. So um, how, how effective is this system in finding those transition points? Because that would be, yeah. you know, as, as the person riding the horse, right, I right. don't want the horse to transition at the wrong moment. Right. Or have a misstep or the, we don't have a way of doing that automatically. But if you, if you think of that picture I showed with the uh, manifold and then this area around it that's stable, mm -hmm. if you have, maybe this is trotting and this is cantering, there, if these things overlap, right, when you're somewhere in this region, if you can do an action that jumps you across here, then you'll remain stable. No, because this is a high dimensional space, and we don't have a we don't have a good way of getting reliable bounds on these yet. Um, we're sort of mining control theory for for inspiration for that. But the idea is that you can jump from one stable region to another, and the the, the trick would be to find the closest approach of those stable regions, which is going to be tricky. Could you learn that separately? So, for example, the um, the optimal way to transition in martial arts from a block to a punch. Right. Right. You probably could. I mean, the, the way we've thought about doing it is you treat each of these as a state in an, uh, an FSM, and then you learn which transitions you can do through that FSM. And those transition probabilities, and so there's like a dead state there where you try it and you, you just fail and you fall over. And so those transition probabilities on the same action sort of reflect how close these things are to each other. Um, the nice thing about working with simulations is you can do this and not have to euthanize any horses. Um, but yeah, that's kind of a tricky thing. We, again, we haven't really thought about that very hard yet. But it's once we get into control, once we get b so back towards thinking about robots, then this might be an interesting, an interesting direction to pursue.